So good afternoon to everybody uh, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, ELTA is very happy to have you on board and very happy to have with uh, us two very relevant legal tech entrepreneurs. On one hand, I'm going to introduce you to Philippe Kadebach. He um, is the um, um, promoter of Flight Right. I'm Pablo Rabanal from Spain. Philippe is from Germany, sorry I didn't say it. I'm Pablo Rabanal from Spain, uh, who is the promoter of Reclamador. Let me uh, give the word to uh, Philippe and then to Pablo. They will introduce themselves, explaining who they are and uh, why they decided to jump into the field of uh, legal claims and uh, become uh, entrepreneurs in, uh, in this sector. Uh, Philippe, please introduce yeah. yourself. Thank you, Maria, um, with pleasure. So uh, my name is uh, Philipp Kadelbach. Uh, I'm from Berlin, uh, Berlin born and, and raised uh, in Germany, uh, 44 years old, two kids. Um, and I had a very classical career as a, as a lawyer. I studied law in Berlin and in uh, South Africa, Cape Town, but I always tackled the issue of consumer consumer law, so I always had an interest in consumer law issues. And and then I opened up my own law practice in, in intellectual property law and IT law in Berlin, a little small boutique law firm. But um, I think uh, I always had a very strong entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurial interest. So I think I always felt I wanted to do something which is maybe a little, little different from just running a, a classical uh, uh, law firm. And um, yeah, basically, I just came across the issue of, of, of passenger rights. And that was actually um, on, a, on a flight from Amsterdam back to Berlin. And I really had to be in time uh, because it was a preparation meeting for my wedding. And the flight was uh, heavily delayed. Uh, and I nearly missed my wedding preparation. And uh, because that was such an issue, I, I really looked into the issue of air passenger rights. And I thought, uh, there's really hard to, to find it good solution for, for for air passengers to enforce their right. And then uh, the idea of uh, setting up a legal tech company came up back in 2009. And that was kind of the starting point to become a legal tech entrepreneur. Uh, and I opened up a, a website um, in 2000, beginning of 2010 with a with a good friend and we just said this is a test run and it, it worked quite well uh, from and we we continued on that path of growth and legal text in sand and uh, that's basically my my legal text story how I came in. Okay very interesting and very typical um, experience and reasons why somebody decide to set up its own company and it's common with what Pablo experienced and why Pablo is in this business. Pablo, do you want to tell the audience who you are and why you are a legal tech entrepreneur? Please? Yes, um, well, I'm actually not a lawyer. I am an economist. Um, I began working in investment banking, then I switched to film production. Um, then I switched again after three years after five years in film production to uh, the betting industry, I was the CEO of, of the retail arm of BWIN, the, the Austrian company. Um, after that, I, I, was, I was looking for an idea for, to launch a new business and um, I had an issue. It was, not, it was not with an airline, it was with a telephone company and uh, I, just couldn't, I just couldn't solve it. I talked to consumer associations and uh, I realized there was really, really a big gap where technology could take place in, in handling small claims that, that a regular lawyer uh, would not do because they, they simply couldn't see that there was a margin if, if, if we include the use of, of technology. So we began Reclamador in 2012. Um, so far, we have over 200,000 clients. We claim over 150 million euros. And 
Um, so far, we, we have a success ratio of 98% of the claims we have we have solved, and we're claiming uh, against airlines, we're claiming against banks, and we're claiming against insurance companies, and we're claiming medical negligences, and we're claiming labor negligences. And that's basically that's that that's my background, and that's how I got into into legal tech because of a personal issue. Very interesting and very impressive ratio of 99% of success. Um, and extremely impressed with that. I'm not sure that many lawyers can say the same about the uh, matters that they deal with. Let's start with uh, some questions. We have in total eight questions. We are going to ask one after the other to the two speakers. They will give their view on each one. And when we are ready, uh, we're going to give you the opportunity of uh, posing your own questions. So um, you can also ask what you want to know, and then we will just uh, take a session by probably around 8.30 or something like that. So the first question for the two of you, and uh, I don't know if it, we want to follow all the time in the same order, or it's up to you. The first one who starts, starts, okay? Is which are the main challenges that both your companies uh, are facing at the moment? Are they uh, legal challenges? Are they economic financial challenges? Are they internal organizational challenges, human resources challenges, client challenges? Tell us, please. So Pablo, you want to start or shall no, I No, be my guest, please. Okay. Be my guest. You go first. Well, I'm first. Yeah. Okay, um, so I think uh, uh, legal tech um, has, uh, or the business we do has has quite some some uh, different challenges that that all come together. I think uh, if there's not much to do if you don't get cases, so it all starts uh, with with the marketing. You really have to to find uh, the, the the clients, the air passengers in our case. Out, out there and, and we we do a lot of online marketing and um i think we were like really pioneering uh, this this space uh, uh, back in 2010 starting from germany and since then expanded into uh, i think eight or nine countries as of today but uh, by doing that we have inspired a lot of competitors so the the the, the online marketing game is, is is really competitive and we are really at a very very high level i cannot imagine any other area of legal tech where you have so much uh, so much competition and it's really about optimizing uh, like your your cost per order your advertising costs so that that is really uh, a challenge and you really have to put a lot of intelligence and resources into that um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, of course, because um, we are all working on a no win, no no fee basis, uh, and you basically have to really pre-finance everything from the beginning, uh, uh, acquiring a case to operating the case through your system, and then if you have to enforce a claim in a in a certain legislation, you also have to finance uh, all the litigation including external lawyers uh, court fees and so on and that uh, depending on the legal system takes time so to really uh, yeah control and steer uh, your 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 revenue and have a very good uh, prediction uh, when certain revenues will come is is really important um, because this is always kind of a certain bet into the future. So this is uh, to, to have a very good understanding and to have very good planning of, of what will happen in six months or maybe in some jurisdiction 18, 24 months in the future is important. And then, of course, it's a it's a litigation game uh, in, in many areas, uh, because if, if your opponent, like in our case, the airlines do not freely pay, then we really have to go to court the claim uh, and that uh, can be and we do it in, in various uh, uh, different jurisdictions and um, every jurisdiction have its own rules you need your your own civil procedure laws your own lawyers they have different rules and to really have a, a, a very good intelligence uh, to have a very good procedure 
procedures to steer these things uh, and to be efficient in, in what you do is extremely important. And I think it has really two dimensions because we as FlightRight, we do really um, the high stake litigation. So I think we currently have five cases running uh, with the European Court of Justice. But also we have more than, uh, I think, 25,000 running cases at lower costs, lower courts. And to, to really see the whole portfolio, to understand the portfolio, to see your risk, to see your chances, that is that is a challenge, and and we feel that uh, since we're doing this for eight years now, it's um, we're really getting uh, from year to year to a high level, and and, uh, uh, and learning more and more, and getting better and better from from year to year. And, uh, that's that's the chance, but also the the challenge. Um, yeah. But also, last point: be kind of differentiate yourself from the comp competition, uh, and and always kind of really. Lead your your space that that you're in, and, and, and try to do something better or more more advanced or different than than your or all, all your, your 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 competitors, all the Me Too companies that that are out there. Very impressive data. Twenty five thousand open cases. We are really impressed. Um, okay, Pablo, do you want to tell us about the challenges that Reclamador is facing at the moment? Which are they? Yeah, actually, they have a lot to do with some of the things uh, Philip mentioned. I would say the the main one is a cash flow issue because uh, we need to litigate in over 90% of the cases, and the Spanish legal system, compared to other legal systems in Europe, it's it's one of the worst. Actually, it's um, on average, it's taking us, for example, in bank claims, over 700 days to solve cases. So as, as of today, we, we have over 20 million euros in fees in court that we will get at some point. Uh, but, you know, at some point, and it, it just keeps on getting worse and worse. So we need to, we, we have a really strong cash flow issue with, with has a lot to do with another challenge, which is the, the lack of awareness, the lack of focus uh, of the administration, uh, that they really need to include technology in the processes. Uh, in the access of consumers to to defend their rights, as they're doing in many other in many other different fields, like for example, uh, you know the tax authorities, the Spanish tax authorities are a big example all over the world. We have people coming from China, from the U.S. because it works as a as a clockwork, but the civil courts and the mercantile court proceedings are really really slow. And um, I also agree with Philip that there's a lot of competition in the arena, but uh, I would say that. Uh, our main challenge there is also the lack of awareness from the consumers that they, they can claim their rights. Uh, I believe there's enough market, for example, in, in airlines, just in Spain, we're talking about in, in the region of 2 million people that can claim a year, and over 90% of, of them are still unaware that they can claim their rights. So 90%, yeah. 9-0? Yeah. 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 Wow. That's, uh, I can really confirm that the Spanish uh, system is quite uh, problematic in terms of speed and efficiency, Pablo. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Okay, so Spain has a lot to do. We will write about it and send this to the right people. Don't worry, Philippe and, and Pablo. Uh, <laughs> many you. things have to change in our country. Uh, but Pablo, you mentioned yeah, one but... thing, and maybe I want you to put more emphasis on that. You said that um, a lot of claims which are small claims could be dealt in a different way and not through the traditional uh, legal procedures that we have in this country. Which are the solutions that you would suggest for authorities to use in order to reduce uh, expenses and the delays, etc.? Well, actually, there's 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 one very simple thing. Um, as as I mentioned before, we need to litigate in over 90% of the cases. If I ask this question to Philip, how many cases you need to take to court, Philip, in Germany? I wouldn't say it's it's the the flip side of it, but it's definitely uh, less than uh, 30%. They take wow. less than th we need to take 90%, and they need to take less than 30%. Why is this happening? It's very simple. At the end, we, we are litigating against the same airlines, and it's just because of the court system. In Spain, every, every uh, legal procedure below 2,000 euros, 
uh, doesn't have any additional expense for, for an airline. So they just delay the payment and they're using justice as a, as a cash flow tool instead of, instead of justice as a, as a service to the, to the consumer. So it would be as simple as, as setting penalties for the ones that are breaking the law on top of the um, compensations they have to pay for the, for the um, airline regulation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In Germany, which is the limit, uh, Pablo mentioned 2,000 euros, no cost for the airline in Germany. Well, in Germany, there, there, there is no, no limit in terms of, uh, uh, so first of all, there's a very clearly established loser pays principle in Germany. It means if you, uh, as an airline, lose a case in court, you have to pay all court fees of your opponent. Also, uh, if you use an advocate pre-court, you have to use these additional fees and you have to pay interest and all these things. So uh, on average, it, 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 uh, it's kind of, it doubles, if you lose in court, it doubles your cost. And that is, uh, that seems to work uh, as an incentive to settle uh, uh, amicably, settle out of court, uh, because in the in the long run, it will be much uh, more expensive uh, yeah. for you as a debtor. And um, and and we basically what Pablo has described, we've seen exactly this uh, when we started back in 2010. And and we as a, as a claims management company, we had to show and demonstrate our capability to first bring and operate these all these uh, huge number of cases in, in into court proceedings and then win these court proceedings and then in the end um, the airlines realize that it really is more expensive and it's also a compliance issue because if you see all the data and, and the airlines are losing we can really clearly do, uh, document and um, demonstrate that it's a it's an intended breach uh, of 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 the consumer law, so that that seems to was the trigger, I think, to to, to that that airlines, uh, particularly German airlines, changed their mind and had a much fairer uh, way dealing with these claims. And this is what we predict in, in for for other jurisdictions. But um, of course, uh, the 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 this other systems shouldn't shouldn't be kind of yeah shouldn't um, favor an intended breach of, of the opponent uh, because there are no, no real, uh, it, the system doesn't create a real pain or financial pain on the side of the airline. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's jump into the second question. Uh, although you have already partly answered, describe the level of competition at your market, who are your main competitors and what makes you different from them? So could you please describe deeply your competition? Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, they are in the in the area of uh, passenger right air passenger rights compensation. I assume there are maybe fifty to seventy uh, uh, competitors uh, European wide who are offering this service. I think uh, um, in every country. There um, maybe is a is a is a clear local champion, and then there are a few companies who are really operating uh, this service um, European wide. Um, we are uh, we are one of those uh, European wide players. AirHelp is one of these European wide players. Fairplane is one of these European wide players. Uh, and Pablo, I, I think you're you're more focused to Spain, right? Yeah, we're only yeah. focused in Spain. Yeah. So um. And uh, I think, like the level of of, of competition is is more advanced, uh, or is quite advanced within the 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 companies that um, do this this that provide the service European wide, uh, mostly because they uh, have a certain size uh, and they have a certain intelligence because they have to manage various uh, jurisdictions. And um, I think in terms of in terms of what is really differentiates the the the, the various players, I think some have uh, some have a kind of premium advanced products. We, for instance, have a service which is called Flight Right Now, where you can get your money within eight minutes. So uh, I, I, there's I think only one one other German company who's doing this. 
uh, and um, of course, uh, then there are some who are very strong in the business to consumer B2C and some have some partnerships uh, where they're stronger in that area. So kind of the case inflow from comes either more from consumers or, or from some partners like online travel agencies and some have, have both of these uh, things. And then I think there are some companies um, and we are amongst them, as I said, to really invest into shaping the industry on a, on a political side nationally uh, together with Pablo. We are also running the, the uh, APRA, uh, which is a European uh, organization for air passenger rights advocates. And we're really trying to, to protect the legislation and work towards a more consumer friendly legislation. And, um, and but also who shape the industry by really bringing cases up to higher courts where we see there are loopholes or things where, where we don't like certain legislation. We believe we have to bring this to a highest court to 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 have a uh, to have a um, yeah to have a ruling on this. For instance, on the issue of strike, whether strike on the airline is an a, a extraordinary circumstance that has been uh, um, open and not not clarified for for the many 10,000 people with, who, who were stranded with TUI fly in uh, late 2016. And we managed to bring this to the European Court of Justice and the, the European Court of Justice ruled in favor of, of, of uh, the consumer. This is something where you really have to make an investment, but I think some companies believe that it makes sense to do this investment because they can bring this back into their processes and it, 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 it will help them in the long run to differentiate. So very interesting that what you are doing, you know. And um, do people know about it? Do people know because somehow you are like uh, doing some kind of uh, corporate social responsibility. You are assuming tasks that uh, maybe some consumer associations should be doing, but you as companies are doing that. Yeah, we both doing that. As I mean, we're Philip, uh, our sales flight right. Also, you claim uh, we, we we're doing that. Yeah. I, I don't know if I would call it uh, social responsibility, but uh, certainly we needed to get together and with a unique voice to to counterpart what the what the European Commission and the European Council are proposing sometimes. Okay. Okay. So um, for the market uh, question, do you want to add something more, Pablo, or do you think that we are already said there? Um. I believe our main competitors in the Spanish market are the ones Philip mentioned, uh, Flyrite uh, and AirHelp. Flyrite is doing a uh, heavy advertising on TV. Philip, Philip didn't warn me about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say that uh, in the Spanish arena, at least we, we I, I believe we are, we are the, the leaders in, in number of claims and uh, we are really close to the Spanish um, legal procedure system which is very peculiar and very unique and uh, we're also offering a wide range of uh, different claim services and i guess that that's what what makes us different regarding this these other players that are only focusing airlines and there's uh, there's also many traditional law firms claiming uh, against banks and um and I guess insurance companies, etc. But uh, I believe we are the only ones proposing a legal digital service with all that it implies. Um, the last data we have is that we're responsible for 22% of the mercantile court proceedings in Spain. And we only have 45 lawyers in house. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, yeah. That's in impressive uh, data. Um, Okay, next question. Um, Maria, me. Uh, yeah, you, you, you mentioned one point and I feel this is, uh, it's very true. And I really wanted to, to ask Pablo, how, how do you feel um, from a Spanish perspective, if you, if you feel the same? Because Maria, you said 
uh, you sometimes feel that we step in as in where where some consumer organization should have done certain things or should do some things and and we we really feel that they that they uh, that there is a, is a is a void where where somebody really needs to to go in and, and help consumers because nobody else and not the consumer organization were doing this uh, and it's a it's a kind of a very interesting uh, relationship uh, at the moment because we feel more and more that they regard us not as somebody who's kind of really uh, clothing the gaps or, or stepping into the void, but rather they feel that uh, like private consumer protection is something which should shouldn't be done by shouldn't be done or, or kind of which which they should have to, which they should have done, but since they are not doing it, they maybe feel nobody should do it. Uh, this is something where which I tend to believe. Uh, that and, and we, re I believe we have to really uh, change this perception because it, uh, from a consumer perspective, this is, is totally wrong and it doesn't make sense. And, uh, where where we, we, there need to be a solution. And if the public body is not doing it, then we have to step in. Yeah. So what you are saying is that, in your opinion, uh, the public authorities are not assuming the responsibility they have in order to protect consumer rights and therefore companies such as yours are jumping in and let's say leading this um, this, um, this this war no, this fight to to protect consumers yeah i think there's a shortage and we are going in and filling the gap like we're we're, we're like there was a deficiency in the system and we we kind of uh, we fixed the problem in the legal system but i think that that the, the job that we're doing, which is very important, and kind of the number of people we are, we are, we we're taking care for. I think we are in the area of one million now, is is quite a, a impressive. But uh, I think we deserve more, more credit for this from the classical consumer agency, which I cannot see yet that we, that we're getting this. And I think this, they really needs to kind of. We really need to rethink this this whole thing, how how it, classical consumer protection has worked in the past and how it should work in the future. Yeah, okay. but um, I just just one thing. I fully agree with what, what Philip is mentioning. But uh, my experience, at least in Spain, we've approached some of the main uh, consumer associations, and you know they really really used to a way of doing things, which is uh, basically it's uh, their business model is a subscription fee that they get every month. They're not they're not used to litigating. Um, my feeling is that they're seeing that companies like Flyright or Reclamador, you know, and we're working on a no win, no fee basis, solving concrete cases with a strong commitment. And uh, at the end, they see us as, as a as a threat to what they've been doing in the in the last years. But uh, I agree with Philip that there's a lot of work to do in in that way for them to realize that we are all going, I mean, we're all fighting for the same, which, has, which is uh, protecting consumers, and that's about it, yeah. yeah. Okay, before when we were talking about competition, none of you mentioned consumer associations. In Spain, it's true some associations are not charging a subscription, but others um, are charging a subscription and they are getting into judicial claims and they have a big staff of lawyers. So are they competitors? Are they not? What are the difference between them and you? And uh, in Germany, I don't know how the market is, but maybe Philippe, you can tell us if the same is happening. Um, in just, just to mention Spain, um, to be honest, I don't see them as, as competitors. Most of them are litigating, especially in, in uh, bank claims, but with a very traditional model. Uh, they okay. get into agreements with uh, external law firms and they pass the cases to external law firms. Uh, we have a team of 20 people working in a software solution to to manage claims and we can handle a really, really large volume of claims uh, with way more, less resources. So at the end, what we, we are providing, it's a legal digital service, which is what is what is disrupting the market. And I, I believe in, to me, we're making things easier for the, for the consumer. They can do everything through their laptop or through their mobile. And 
and they don't have to advance any fees or pay any a, a, any subscription. So it's it's a complete different approach. Yeah, I think it's 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 quite the same. They I think uh, in in Germany uh, consumer association they do uh, some landmark cases like they take whatever a certain scenario and, and do one case against one player, but I. I, I'm quite quite convinced that no consumer ag uh, association in Germany has ever enforced uh, a compensation for a passenger. So th they they are not doing this kind of stuff. Um, and they said, yeah. So so th this is what I said. There's a there's a problem in the legal system, and and we're we're closing it because they cannot do it. They cannot manage large volume of claims. They're not digitized, and um, so. It's it's just a yeah. There's a shortage in the system, and and they 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 cannot cannot full close that gap. And I think it's also not their 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 their, their traditional role to do these kind of things. Okay. Okay. Very very interesting. Um, let's jump into technology. Uh, what kind of technology are you using, uh, Pablo? You already mentioned something about what you are using. Uh, could you tell us uh, uh, which software, software platforms are you using, more details? Are you developing yourself uh, the, is, is own developed technology? Is it technology, cloud technology, uh, Spanish, from which countries? Uh, yeah, we use of course we're using cloud technology and um, our frame our technology framework is uh, Django and um, we're building our, our own case management software which is which is at least as, as, as far as I'm concerned in Spain the the most productive one in in terms of uh, claims handled per per lawyer. So it's it's all done in house. It's really core and of course you know we integrate with external solutions for already existing in the market um, to complete our value proposition like Zendes for for example for customer care but uh, what's really really core for us it's legal operations and it's critical for us to have it in-house and to develop to develop it by by ourselves so how many yeah. people are working in your team um it's in in our product team there's like 20 people right now wow mm -hmm. And outside, or is it, is it all in-house, or are you? No, all in, all in-house, all in-house. Okay. It's all in-house. Okay. Um, so you are not using the platforms that traditional suppliers offer, but your own. Mm -hmm. And for from information, the very, but from like, the very um, beginning. Okay. And what yeah. about you, Philippe? I think we we chose the same uh, path uh, like Pablo uh, when we started uh, back in. 2010, there were no real systems that could uh, that we could use for, for our specific use case available. Uh, at the, I think for the first two years, we tried to heavily customize a cloud-based CRM system, but uh, we were really uh, we were finally we were at the end of it, and then we used our, our learnings and built our own Java-based backend and front-end uh, uh, with our own team. Our own team is, I think, uh, 22 uh, developers, uh, plus we have a product product team of six people, and then we have a BI team of, of three people. So in the area, it will be more or less 30 people dealing with that um, system. And it's, um, yeah, front end and back end. Um, and we also have a, a very, very sophisticated um, business intelligence service and team which allows us uh, on a, on a artificial, artificial intelligence uh, based algorithm to really uh, uh, use all our experience from eight years litigation and, and, and case intake against airline to, to, to have a quite sophisticated prediction system and, and uh, about uh, the chance of success of future cases. So we can we can really, um, if we want, we could kind of fully automate the the all our procedures, and, and we're really getting more and more to 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 steer our our case uh, uh, flow by using uh, our AI uh, services, uh, which we internally develop. 
Okay. And then of course we also have integrated with uh, uh, like standard standard tools which which are just commodity uh, on on marketing or email email mm -hmm. services and so on. But that's yeah, I think that's just standard normal. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's go into um, the other question we have um, prepared, which is. Um, uh, could you please describe your unique selling proposition? Yeah, well, in our case, it's quite simple. It's click to claim. You can do everything from home and through your computer. And uh, we work in on a success fee basis. And uh, we we have our values really, really clear and are based on, on transparency and and the management of expe expectations from customers so they know you know when the trial date is um what's our commission going to be how is the case going etc just by getting into our website without needing to to call us or or visiting us okay so transparency would be like uh, something very very important for your company yeah okay. yeah what about i realize you? there's i'm oh, sorry i just realized that there's quite a lack a lot of lack of transparency in traditional law firms. I don't know why. I get into into many of the, the websites, and it's you know how much you charge. It's it's impossible to know because they because they're not yeah. used to mentioning. I don't know if it's the same in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. So I think our our USP is is quite similar to to what Pablo described on a, on a on a general basis like compared to, to to other services like the traditional services it's it's no win no fee base which is super important for for uh, most of the passenger because in, in like you have to know that in 50 percent of the cases air uh, in 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 yeah, air passenger cases uh, 261 cases there uh, there can there is uh, extraordinary circumstances. So in, if you would go to a lawyer and lose that case, you can end up with um, having invested 400 euros and, and finally ending up with a, with a minus of, of 400 euros. So that is something that people don't want at small claims. Uh, this is a so-called rational disinterest that you didn't rather leave it than to invest to, to have a risk of financial loss. So I think it starts with this. Plus, it's a digital service. It's as easy as yeah. booking a flight to, to to hire us. It's very clear what you have to pay. It's a contingency fee of 25% plus VAT. Um, and then I think what makes us uh, uh, quite um, differentiates us from from most of the competitors is that. Because we are the number one, because we are like the oldest player out there in the market, because we've litigated so many cases and because we plucked in all these experience and know how into our system, we believe that um, from any claim you will get that we that you will give to us, we are the ones who, who will it derive the most value out of it, like get the highest compensation and, and most probably also uh, uh, we will also be the fastest ones because like uh, we build up a reputation which helps us when, when dealing with the with the airline. I mean, most of the airlines, we have uh, amicable agreements. We're friendly with them. So that, that really helps the process and that helps the consumers uh, as well if, if they if they uh, engage us with dealing with their clients. Okay. So let me go to the next question. Uh, sorry, I lost the paper here. Um, so if you had to describe me uh, the, the typical profile of um, a client, how would it be? Or maybe you have different segments of clients. Could you please describe how they are? Philip, you want to go? Uh, no, maybe you can do it because I realized that I have to put some light in this room. Maybe okay. I'll, I'll just get some light and you'll continue with that. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, well, it's, it's, we have 
many many different segment of uh, of clients i mean for example in airlines we have from from the low cost traveler uh to the um business executive who's a frequent traveler to the um latin american community which travels once a year to the country to families that travel together to celebrate something it's it's really variety if if if, if we talk about banking then it's 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 also the same. It's it's mainly couples, and uh, it's under they're usually under 35s or early 40s. Um, if we're talking about tax claims, which we're doing against city halls, maybe it's older people with everything related to to heritages, etc. It's really varied. I mean, there's there's, there's two million people that can claim. Um, um, air passenger rights. There's a uh, eight million people that can claim back their cost in a, because they subscribe a mortgage with the bank. There's five million people that can claim their taxes back against their city halls when they sell a house. It's so wide that it's. I mean, it's. It, it's it's really it's really 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 wide. So yeah. Okay. What about the profile of your company in different countries where you are, Philippe? You have to repeat it. I just put on my headphones at that okay. second. Okay. Uh, no, I'm asking you about the profile uh, of your clients in the different countries where you are located, acting. Mm. Well, look, uh, I mean, as I said, it, it will will be in the area of one million. So there's not the, the it's it's quite. It's quite a range, you know. Um, I think, uh, like, and we we are we are modeling all the different people, uh, uh, our clients, which is various personas. And uh, one persona is, of course, the family with with uh, two kids going for summer holiday. Um, then it's like older people, but also like smart people who say like younger smart people who could maybe do it alone, but uh, they just think, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to spend much time with it. It's just the convenience that somebody takes care. It's. I know this is a new service. It's. It's how I. I want to live. I want uh, digital access to services, and it just takes me two minutes. And this is what I enjoy. Um, yeah. It's. It's quite diverse, I would say. So you. You couldn't say it's. It's quite of like the people that are flying, business travelers as well. So I, I, I can't really pinpoint to a, a specific persona, which is like the typical client. Okay, so that means that from the marketing point of view, you are obliged to do very different kind of campaigns and your targets are really different. That, 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 that makes it complicated, no? I think we 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 shoot we shoot um i don't know the english word but we 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 rather shoot in any in in every direction than try to really uh focus uh focus on one persona because there is not this one persona which which you can tailor your marketing to it's people everybody is flying and 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 everybody who's flying is our potential customer and and everybody who's our potential customer can is, most probably will like our service, Pablo's service, because they are just very good and convenient. Okay. Okay, so let's go into the next question. Um, I think you kind of answer it. I am going to read it anyway, but we probably already answered. How does the European legal system respond to the challenges of today's citizens? And are there precise fields that need big legal changes? And if so, please specify. Um, I don't think, I, I think what, what European uh, legislators do understand, uh, start to understand that there's a deficiency, or let me start a, a different way. They do understand that uh, it's different of having uh, uh, putting certain rights, uh, consumer rights, citizens' rights on paper, uh, and and uh, enforcing them, particularly if, if it's a situation where a rather unempowered consumer wants to enforce against a quite 
professional uh, corporate or uh, uh, corporate organization uh, as the so-called repeat players because the one the consumer is doing it once in his lifetime whereas uh, corporations who have a, a maybe legal risk they have professional um, in-house legal system they have law firm and they do this every day so they're repeat players so this is what I think Europe, European policymakers uh, are more and more understanding uh, that there's a uh, that there is an imbalance uh, and that you not only have to take care about putting certain rights on paper like putting them in making them making laws but also uh, taking more care about uh, how these rights can be efficiently enforced. Uh, and this is why they introduced, for instance, the ADR regulation and other regulations. But I think nobody really has looked into specifics of small claims uh, enforcement. And I think um, this is something which has to happen, particularly, I think there's no better example to see and analyze the deficiencies than if you really deep dive into the the um, yeah, air passenger rights enforcement because you have so many cases uh, and you really can compare the different legal systems, Germany against uh, Spain, for instance, and see why is why are things working much better in, in, in Germany or Austria than in Spain or even in France and what are the problems? And you can really go into a, a million number of cases and really see the differences and see where, where they come from. And this, I think, it's a chance um, and if, if people on Europe on the European level are really interested to make the systems work and to have efficient consumer protection, then they should really come to us and, and, and ask us for our data and ask us for our opinion. And I hope this, that this will happen. And maybe Alta can, can facilitate this as well. This would be great because I think it's yeah. important. Yeah, we there. I, I can tell you that the, the board of Elta has been discussing very often where can we really add value, and we are aware that in benchmarking uh, we can be very good because we have representatives in in any European country, and uh, we are thinking now of uh, maybe doing some research on artificial intelligence. By why not doing some research? On, on the protection of uh, consumer rights. I think it's an excellent idea, and maybe we can uh, propose uh, uh, this to the to the coming uh, board meet meeting and, 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 and launch something European broad to compare and find good practices. I, I take note of it. So Pablo, do you want to add something on this? No, I fully agree to what Philip stated. I mean, and we have a lot of data to be shared, so we're happy to share every, everyone aware of, of what's going on. I, I in the Spanish case, I'm, I, I would like to say that uh, the best piece of news is that uh, we have a European co Court of Justice who is constantly correcting our Supreme Court. <laughs> so, so. Just say say thank you to them from from here because they're the, they are the main protectors of uh, of consumer rights. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe okay. maybe I I think one 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 more thing that I want to add is that we we realize and I'm sure Pablo will realize even more that the the national like from the national member countries like the the civil procedure uh, that has been enacted is not made for digital procedures it's it's like it, it's really made for the old traditional way where a lawyer comes personally to court you have hearing it takes very long it's not time box it's not fast it's analog uh, and and you can sometimes you can really also uh, kind of use certain rights uh, to to prevent uh, to prevent access to your rights uh, Honest of proof, for instance, I think in, 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 in Spain for certain things that you really was on the plane and these things or that the flight was really delayed. So I think it, it would make sense to to, to modernize the, the, the civil procedure and, and kind of modernize to the to a more digital world where also legis litigation is, is uh, triggered in a, in a more digital way or, or something like that.
Yeah. Okay. So, um, do you have any like concrete demand for the European legislator or for your own country legislator? Um, ah, actually, many. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me take note of the. Of that. No, but I, I fully agree with Philip that we need to harmonize what consumer, how consumer rights are protected in in each country. So, for example, he was stating in. In Germany, it's the airline that has to prove that you didn't take the flight. In Spain, some, sometimes it's not enough with the uh, with the plane ticket, and you need to keep the boarding pass. You know why? We're talking about the same region, and and, and there's a list of passengers uh, of the airlines. And um, in Spain, there's some things which which are common sense. For example, there's now we can present things uh, digitally, lawsuits digitally. But we need to face seven different softwares to do this. Each one of a different region, just because we are a country of nations, or, or call it what you want. But it's at the end, it's 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 just wasting uh, public money, and it it doesn't make any sense. None of them work properly, and and and, and there's a clear lack of of focus in the in the administration on 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 how to deal with this. Um, yeah, and, and I would also add for the Spanish arena that uh, at least you know the Supreme Court should be more careful when when stating the rulings and take into account what the European Court of Justice is is saying and what they know some they're going to say sometimes because you know what, what this is provoking is just a a collapse in the in the in the, in the Spanish courts. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about you, Philip? Do you have any? Uh, petitions for a legislator? Um, well, I think in generally it would be good if if, if you have a, a like for legal tech companies like we have that you have a kind of a, a European European law uh, maybe to provide uh, a safe harbor for European wide compliance. Uh, uh, for legal tech company themselves, how we operate, no win, no fee. Uh, and and I think Pablo mentioned this thing that uh, uh, some things do work differently in Spain than they work in in Germany, and and that is maybe that we should have a system where the price for uh, where there is a, a price, a clear price for a breach of consumer laws, like that could be a penalty if you yeah. you know in the end. And uh, and I see this is a problem in Spain. I see this is a problem in France and. I think we should correct this because this is the only way how we we will reach a higher level of of compliance uh, and a higher level of of consumer uh, um, rights. If if it's not a, a kind of if there's not a positive business case in breaching, consequently strategically breaching uh, passenger rights or consumer rights. Yeah, and that is something where European I think European Union has to. To, to look in, and I think the, the key word is uh, effet utile. So if you don't have this, then you, uh, European laws will not be effective throughout Europe. Mm, okay. Okay. So my last question, um, it's already answered because you already explained us that uh, you, Pablo, are acting only at the national level, while you, Philippe, um, uh, are acting at the international level, but maybe uh, you could tell us, Philippe, what are the the difference in markets and in, in, in complication in these different countries where you are? Which is the most difficult country for your business? Which is being the easiest? Uh, can you tell us about? And Pablo, if you are looking at other countries or you have experience and you want to share your views on that, you are also welcome to do it. Now here I have to rely on Philip. His his experience is way better than mine. Well, as a, as a general thumb rule, uh, and to make it very easy, uh, I think Austria is very good. Germany uh, is good. Sweden is good. Uh, what else? I think uh, uh, Spain, France, Italy are not so good. So it's kind of you know from from. North to south, uh, we believe that the systems are working more efficiently in the in the north. Uh, 
than than in the south and you can see that uh, and and the uk is is in between and the uk is quite okay but <laughs> it's in between so and 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 you can see this uh, how how fast court are deciding if you bring a court to to uh, if, if you bring a case to the court you can see how digitized or how digit how digital the the access to the legal system is you can see this uh, often in terms of uh, whether you have a clearly uh, clearly established loser pays principle whether you can predict uh, if you win a case that you can recollect uh, or that the, the airline has to reimburse you for for the costs so as a general rule this is it yeah. and then there's Netherlands in in Belgium, it's it's somewhere in the in between between uh, I think France and the UK. Okay, okay, so it's very interesting. There is a north and south case here. Yeah. Um, good to know, and maybe we should try to to mm -hmm. abolish that differences. No, they, they are completely unfair. If we are Europeans, we should have the same access to justice and the same rights, the guarantee. Oh. And the worst is Ireland, and one uh, one uh, uh, one very quite public uh, uh, prominent airline is based there. And they've <laughs> introduced a, a clause that you can only sue them in Ireland. Just because. <laughs> have you heard of Have you heard of this uh, airline? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rings a bell. Yes, we know we know which one you are talking about. <laughs> Okay, um, let me ask you one more question. So you are fighting for the rights of um, consumers, but are consumers always happy with your services? And how difficult is it, to, is it being to cope with the needs and um, wishes of consumers? Uh, how do they look at you? Are they happy with you? Pablo? Yeah, well, I would say that in in general terms, yes, they are. I mean, this and and they are qu quite good. There's, for example, there's a study from the European Commission, which is which has a few years now, but it, it, it stated that two percent of people that claim on their own on airline claims get get a result. We are we over uh, ninety eight percent, as I mentioned before. So. You know, at, at the end, they see us as, as we're solving that they wouldn't do on their own because they don't know how to. And in case they had to, they would waste a lot of time. So the the perception it's 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 really good. And um, and at the end, they 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 clearly see the the value. We we are getting some big numbers now on cross selling on on people that are using our claiming services uh, for more than one product or repeating, for example, and an airline claim and uh, you know without doing any any offline strong advertising now we have over 200,000 clients and that speaks itself i mean i mean it's there's a clear need in the market for for this kind of service uh, because otherwise they just get lost in in phone calls and lack of responses from uh, big companies etc yeah philip and your clients yeah, well, look, I mean, all all people that that get the money uh, that get compensation are generally very very happy, and you can see this. We are measuring our so-called net promoter score on on many touch points, and that is it, it's very competitive. I wouldn't say it's as high as Amazon, but it's close, and. Um, uh, and the people, and it is kind of within the nature of 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 the system that to do not get some money, and that is then due to really force majeure, extraordinary circumstances. They are uh, not as happy as the ones get the who, who, who getting the money. Uh, uh, but uh, on average, it's as Pablo said, the people, even if we don't uh, enforce a claim for them, they are happy because we're transparent. We're ex we're explaining what we're doing. We're updating them. We we they see that we fight um, for their rights uh, and and that we really. Uh, Go the extra mile, uh, and that we take care as a as an older brother, and it's not about money because they realize that 
um, only if we are successful, uh, only if we are successful for them, we will also make uh, uh, or earn our our fees. So uh, and and then uh, it's sometimes a challenge, and I think we can still get better there. For for instance, like um, jurisdictions as we described more south like Italy, Spain, or France, and where we have to litigate um, that. Um, that it, it can take 700 days, as Pablo explained. And then you really have to explain them in a lot of emails why it's taking so long, because it's out of our control. It's the legal yeah. system, and we have to rely on an efficient system. So it's quite a burden for us to explain them that basically it's not our fault that it takes long, but it's, it's, it's the system that is not working as efficiently as it could. So that's sometimes a challenge, but I think we're getting there by really getting better templates, uh, better data, and and so in general, I think um, uh, yeah, that's that's the future in small claims consumer uh, law enforcement. What we're doing, and and I think we, what we can see is that this is really uh, that we that this thing uh, spreads into many more areas, and and that, that there's really a trend on on. On these uh, uh, legal tech services, yeah. So I think that's kind of the the proof that we must somehow do a good job. Okay. That we're inspiring others. Yeah. Okay, it's very interesting. So you're, but you are clearly in a business which is risky because you are claiming for people who claim. So these people are normally uh, people with a uh, high uh, standards of of of. Um, um, to to give them satisfaction, and uh, that that makes it uh, additionally difficult. So you not only have to fight against a system that is not helping, but also you have to be very careful with uh, your own client's demand. So um, for me, these are the questions that we had uh, uh, prepared for you. I don't know if you want to add something to this, or we give uh, the audience the right to ask uh, already. Ah, for me it's okay to go with the audience. Yes. Okay. Same. Philippe. Yes. Okay. Let's go for the audience. Um, um, Julia, do we have any questions from the audience? No. No, not yet. Any questions? Not yet. Not yet. I will see. So there, Carlo Mamo, he raised his hand. Okay. So maybe Carlo, you could type in your question into the um, chat or question section. Or we could also try to give you the speaking rights if you want to. Well, let me see if he's typing something. No, no question yet. So I think maybe so I was no watching, maybe you already got answered. No questions. Ah, so I think. there, there is a question. Okay. It just came in. So Carla said, "Hi, sorry, you found the chat. You will write one." And Dark Deck, I don't know how to uh, pronounce it correctly. What kind of methodology do you use when developing your consumer services? Um, agile methodologies. <laughs> Basically, we we have the client in the in the center of everything, and um, we we like to come out with MVPs and um, and test their feedback and iterate from there the the solution. Yeah. Yeah. Lean, lean, agile, design thinking. Okay, so Carlo if is nobody going else has a question, I have a question for you too. Yeah, okay. I think you can go with your question yes. and Carlo just wrote his question. We can do it right after that. Okay, so one of the challenges that the, um, the legal industry has uh, in order to um, 
to make consumer happier is a uh, language, language use. How do we communicate the legal issues? Um, in some countries like the UK and the States, there have been campaigns promoted by the, by the civil uh, society uh, in order to uh, induce lawyers to speak clearly. Legal lease, uh, legal uh, you know, plain, plain language. Uh, you in your companies, do you have a policy uh, regarding not only transparency or yes, transparency, understanding clear language and simple language as part of the transparency policy? And if so, if you have this kind of policy, how do you implement it in practice? What kind of uh, training do you give lawyers or what kind of, let's say, control of what is written do you do, etc.? Um, I think we have some values. Uh, I think maybe you can see um, some here in my back. Uh, and one is one is clearly give our customers access to justice. And part of this rule of value is that we access means also that they can understand what they what we tell them. And um, and this is, I think, what we learned that we're really trying to translate any legal process, any legal issue, any legal request, any legal information uh, into a language uh, that that we can, uh, that he can understand, uh, being a non-lawyer with no legal background. And I think our marketing team is very helpful there because they, uh, like our legal team, but also our marketing team, our communication team, they really have the uh, as they they have the perspective of the of the consumers of our clients in mind and every piece of communication goes through that uh, gate quality gate and they they are checking whether uh, uh, our standard customer can can understand this and it's a, it's it's important for us and we're really putting a lot of emphasis into this Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, so, it's, it's okay. basically the it's basically the same thing for us. Um, we publish a lot of things in in our blog. It's one of the main sources of of traffic for us, and we always put a lot of effort in. A, you know, I had a teacher who used to say, "Don't put anything into a website that your grandma wouldn't understand." You know, and it's 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 an extreme example, but it actually works quite well. And uh, the, actually, there's, there's a ranking in Spain from the from a um, media called um, Lawyer Press, and uh, we for the first time in last July we we were the they call us law firm. I don't cons I don't consider ourselves as a law firm. We are a technology company that provide legal services, but we were the first ones in the digital reputation ranking they had. And if and if you look at the ones who are coming behind, it's really traditional law firms with with a lot of uh, business background. And I guess it's because we're, we're making legal content uh, accessible to everyone, and and we're trying to democratize justice and to to let everyone have access to justice whenever they need it, as as Philip was mentioning. Okay. Any more questions, Julia? There's one more question. I will read it out. It comes in four messages. So the first one is, do you think new products from insurances like AXA, automated claims of flight delay, um, is a risk for your business in the long term? And one addition to this, um, the service I'm talking about is Fizzy from AXA Insurance and is blockchain based. And their business proposition is your flight is two hours late, get your money without claiming. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I mean, like insurance in general is something which is different because in, in kind of prior to your flight, you have to book that service, uh, you have to pay AXA for 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 fizzy, and um, it's it's it has basically nothing to do with what we do, basically enforcing consumer rights. It's an insurance, and uh, uh, this will never be. Uh, this can never substitute uh, uh, the consumer rights because there you you basically by paying your insurance premium pay for what they pay out later. Whereas it, what we do is there's a European law which uh, we enforce and the airline pays this. So whereas for us 
with our service, it's free. It's no fee. You have to book the airline fee and they make a very, uh, you, you have to subscribe to the insurance. Um, blockchain itself, I think is, uh, is, a, is a quite nice technology and you can, we, we could use it for some use cases. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that this is in any, any way a threat to our business. Yeah, I fully agree. Fully agree. Yeah. Okay. So if there are no, no more questions. questions. No, there aren't. Yeah. There aren't? Okay. No, so, there aren't. Um, okay. Thank you, Julia, then, for helping us with the questions. And uh, Pablo, Philippe, Philippe, Pablo, thank you so very much for being with us today. We, we have been recording this. We will have a video. We will send it to you and we will make it available to all ELTA members. If any of the people who are listening to us are still not members of ELTA, we invite you to join. We are preparing a very, very nice agenda of activities for next year. Philippe, Pablo, please join us and help us, and we will try to help you as well. Uh, I promise you that this idea that you gave us, uh, uh, how to protect uh, uh, consumer rights and how are they at the moment protected in the different countries, if we can find a very concrete thing to do with ELTA members, we will help you. So um, thank you to everybody and have a very, very nice uh, evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Good Bye. night. Bye. Bye, Pablo.